Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're diving into an important ongoing movement toward renewable energy with special guest Ann Evans, CEO of Elevate, which is based in Chicago and is a national organization that advances this cause. So thank you, Ann, for joining us. It's just wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really grateful to be with you and the audience today. So you and your team work nationally uh, to advance programs and services that make renewable, clean energy more accessible to all. And you work to reduce emissions, improve energy efficiency, fight climate change. Just sort of to set this up this conversation, um, I find it so interesting that the demand for re renewable energy is increasing. And this is the interesting part consumption of all other fuels declined last year. So that's the first time that's happened. So yeah. it's clear that, that our future is tied to renewables. So let's talk about how your organization was founded and your ongoing work. Yeah, so our organization was founded by our parent, the Center for Neighborhood Technology, with the goal of spinning us off, um, supporting our growth and future to really focus on making sure that everyone has access to the clean energy future. And I would add that it's not just our future, it's our present. Uh, according to the US Energy Information Administration, which is the federal agency that tracks our energy use and studies it, Already last year, 20% of our electricity generation nationally was from renewable energy. So that's, re that's pretty significant. And as you mentioned, it's growing and it's growing quickly because it both makes sense from an environmental perspective, but also from an economic perspective. Yeah, from a cost perspective, that's, it's really interesting because renewables, particularly solar and wind, right? The, the, the cost is really in the equipment. Uh, at, which, which translates into labor to make the equipment, to maintain the equipment, as opposed to extraction, right? So you end up with a future that is about jobs, is about manufacturing, is about uh, maintenance and services. It is uh, the kind of work that doesn't need to be outsourced. Uh, so it, it's such an interesting uh, approach to creating a stronger economy and a future-oriented economy that involves all. So you you specialize in ensuring that people at the lower end of the income ladder also have ac access to these technologies. Why is that important? Yeah, it's important that nobody be left behind. And I think that when you think about what happens when a nation or the world, you know, frankly, the globe um, makes some kind of big technology shift, what happens to the folks that le are left behind? In the case of this energy um, sector transformation, it means that those fixed costs from the sort of centralized utility and the old fossil fuel infrastructure are being borne by a smaller group of people. And those are the people that are most vulnerable. And so we absolutely, it's an imperative need to make sure that people with lower incomes get access to these technologies first and not last. It's also important to national adoption, right? I mean, if you take a look at the history of this country, you have the Tennessee Valley Authority, rural electrification, right? The whole idea of, of uh, Ford's development of the Model T to popularize um, the adoption of the automobile. If we are a, a country that is really about mass, Right, it's about everyone. So if we can't uh, ensure that these technologies are adopted and reach scale, they end up becoming unsustainable, don't they? Absolutely. And as we've as we've said, we want to make sure that everyone gets access to the jobs as well. Right. So those jobs installing solar panels are um, are good jobs. They right. are pathways. They're a pathway into. Um, union jobs and utility jobs, which are often um, high paying uh, career jobs that really can transform a family's life. And so I think making sure that nobody gets left behind should be something we can all, uh, um, we can all engage on. They also require a certain level of education. So now you have people who are equipping themselves 
with the ability to evolve their skills throughout their career. So they, so in pursuing these types of jobs that are more technically oriented, you're actually shifting the ability of Americans to uh, remain current and to compete in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And these jobs are, um, they're, they're construction jobs. So they really range a whole set of skills and skills and abilities and interests. And I'm a believer that everyone should pursue or should have the opportunity to pursue um, a job and career that they feel really passionate about. And so to advance um, renewables and solar energy and wind energy, we need people who can do uh, system design. And we also need people who can um, explain how um, solar energy systems work when when you when we install them on your roof. So like the communication skills are as important as the financial skills and the and the technical skills. It really is, is a range. So let's talk about the the range of programs that you have because uh, you're not um, uh, focused on just sort of one excuse me uh, one solution set. Um, when you take a look at, at uh, energy, uh, we're talking about uh, material sciences, we're talking about uh, solar sciences, we're talking about um, the uh, whole issue of energy efficiency, uh, conservation of energy, so that we're talking about insulation, those kinds of, of activities. Could you just unpack how you have constructed your program to reference the effective types of solutions that improve the situation for people of low income. Absolutely. And we started by listening to what people in the community wanted and needed and what were their pain points. And what we found is not gonna be super surprising because we all share these same, um, these same goals. We want to have healthy, safe, affordable ways to have heat, cooling, power, um, and water in our homes. So we, it's, it's really about creating that home that's sustainable and safe. Um, and I think we know more, now, we, know, we know now more than ever with COVID when we've asked people to um, shelter in home um, and shelter, shelter in place in home, that those homes have to be healthy and safe and um, safe and affordable. And that, um, you know, some people are seeing higher utility bills because they're they're at home all the time. Their kids are studying from home. Um, they're work they're working from home, and so it's been Im important now more than ever to um, to address address these issues. And what we um, so what we do, how our programs work, is we first educate <laughs> about how and how how we heat power and um, um, and cook and 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 have hot water in our homes because most of us don't don't know you know we we want to be warm but we don't really care we don't think so much about what is the fuel source for making that heat and how that system works so first we educate folks we take a look at their utility bills um, we understand what their pain points are uh, we um, then do um, help provide a list of prioritized active um, work and improvements that can be made in your in your home or in your business that will re will make you more comfortable and reduce your costs. And then we uh, um, uh, uh, we really believe in empowering people, so helping people make decisions about how they want to improve their environments. And then we assemble the grants, um, low cost financing um, in order to get it paid for, because we know that there is no extra, <laughs> there is no extra money to invest, invest in your home if you have, if you have um, a, a really limited income. So the first thing that you have is uh, people are expert in how they're living and what their costs are but they're not necessarily expert in how the energy is provided or how to change that cost structure. You exactly. provide an information exchange 
in terms of what options are. And then they select from those options, the options that make sense uh, to them. One of the things that I think is really interesting about this process is where, where money is lean, solutions need to be practical. They need to deliver uh, benefit as quickly as possible. Are you able to, um, to show your clients uh, the benefit very quickly of working with you? Absolutely. Um, and we, you know, we can show them the dollar savings that they will see on their. And we also stay with people to, uh, to make sure that they're seeing those, that they're actually seeing those dollar savings, because we want to make sure that the technologies are actually working and working as well as possible so that we keep learning as an, as an organization as well. And the projects may be installation, um, behind me on this wall that sometimes people are curious, what, what is that behind me? Um, and the story behind this is I was working out of my kitchen um, and we decided to build um, uh, an enclosure on our back porch so that I could have a door that I could close <laughs> at the end of the day during this time. And we super insulated this space so that it needs very little um, very little energy in order to be comfortable in the summer and in the winter. And as you mentioned, I, I'm based in Chicago and it gets it gets pretty it's cold. Very cold. So, so we're uh, doing insulation is a big is a big piece. It's a big, big, big saver. If you take a look at the other uh, aspects of this, including the generation of energy, um, what are the uh, predominant solutions that are being used in in cold climes like uh, Chicago? Is it is it wind energy? Is it solar energy? What type of energy production uh, predominates? And we did receive a question on that. Yeah. So we're um, so still today in Chicago, in Chicago and in many midwestern cities, um, and we work across um, multiple states. Uh, natural gas is the primary source of um, heating, hot water, and cooking. However, we are seeing a dramatic increase in electricity that is increasingly renewably supplied as the as a growing source of heating, hot water, uh, and cooking. And one of the things that we've learned, because again, we try to take the time to listen to what people want, is that people's um, Prefer, preference around cooking is really not is really based on what they grew up with, which doesn't surprise you. But there's no even though I think you hear a lot that cooking with gas is better somehow. Um, when we actually um, stepped back and asked um, asked families, uh, about half of them prefer cooking cooking with electric. So we are starting to see a shift away from natural gas as a primary source. And in terms of the generation of electrical power, um, what is the primary uh, source of, of that renewable electrical power? Is it solar? Is it hydroelectric dams? Or are there other uh, other uh, mechanisms? In um, in the Midwest, in the Great Plains, it won't surprise you to know that we have um, a lot of uh, a lot of wind generation energy local and so every each state has different policies uh, that um, help promote uh, renewables in different in different ways so increasingly as states in the Midwest and across the country uh, advance um, advanced policies and what are called statewide renewable um, energy portfolio standards we see, increasing adoption of solar. So in Illinois, where I live, solar is, is a growing um, source of electricity generation. So you have a really, uh, a really local response. I mean, Arizona, of course, gets a huge amount of sunshine, whereas uh, if you take a look at Washington State, maybe, uh, maybe less so. And so the response needs to be uh, according to the attributes of that particular state and the needs of its citizens. Exactly, yeah. In and terms of the go, go ahead. I was going to say, when you think about it, if you're on the if you're on the west coast, your energy consumption is way more um, influenced by your hot water use than either heating or cooling, depending on where you are on the west coast, of course. 
Well, that's that's true. You know, I didn't even think of that. So the ability to actually turn around um, uh, hot water um, and, that, and that will affect whether you're using instant on uh, heating or uh, water tank heating uh, or, or, or whatever, which has different storage needs. Uh, I guess it's very, very situational from locale to locale, even within a state. It is. That's very, very true. In terms of how many uh, people you have in the organization and how you deploy your solutions, um, how does that how does that function? If you're working across every state, uh, uh, all these different states, you must have a regionalized approach as opposed to a centralized uh, approach, uh, as well as a regionalized solution set. So, how is your organization structured? Yeah, we absolutely are um, do have a regional approach. It makes sense because the solutions we're delivering are regional. Uh, the relationships are, are regional because one important way that we can advance our mission and you know reach more and more families, and to date we've we've been able to do upgrades in over 80,000 homes, has been through relationships. The other thing we've learned over time is that um, uh, fifty percent of our customers are repeat customers, so they they come back to us because we provide um, an excellent service, and that reduces our cost of um, acquiring you know new new customers. And so we've we've learned a few different things along the way that have really um, s- supported and advanced our growth. And having a regional approach is one of those. One of the uh, questions that we uh, had just uh, asked in, in our poll is uh, how quickly um, people assessed we will get to a, a situation in the United States where most of our energy are provided by um, renewables. Um, in fact, we, we actually posed an even further question. Um, when do we get to the point where uh, the use of fossil fuels, non-renewables, is just a marginal part of our energy picture? Um, what what is your guess? Because I'm going I'm going to dis- describe what people actually said uh, in a bit. But what is your guess when we will get to that to that point, or will we get to that point? Oh, I think we'll get there for sure. Um, by 2035, many states have already um, uh, established policies that the electricity grid will be 100% renewable. So that'll that'll be really important. That's an important date to consider and think about. And is it real, do you think, or is it, or is it one of these things that politicians say and then ignore? I think it's real, and it's not just politicians saying it. It's it's um, it's federal agencies, it's national labs like the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and, and it's um, it's financially it makes good financial sense, and it's good economic policy to invest in re- renewables because it's cheaper and it, it 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 brings in those local jobs that you were talking about earlier so i think it makes sense and it's not only um states counties local governments that are making commitments to be 100 percent renewable it's also businesses uh it's you know across the board um uh corporations that are u.s based or globally based have made these commitments to be 100% renewable. So I think we will be, the electric grid will be 100% renewable by 2035 in most in most parts of the United States. And what we'll be left with is really tackling that fossil fuel con, um, consumption in, in our buildings. And in cars and you know, automobiles and, and yeah. trucks and so on and so forth. You know, we just finished, um, uh, a second of, of two polls. So the second poll was very interesting. Um, we asked, um, we said that energy, every energy source or storage mechanism has an environmental impact. We asked people to select four that they felt had the worst impact. And 91% of people said the worst impact was uh, coal, oil, and gas extracted from the ground. Uh, no surprise. The second area was really interesting. Uh, in terms of adverse impacts is battery storage technology. And I think people are becoming very, very aware that nothing is free, right? So there are always always trade-offs. Battery storage technologies have uh, rare earths and um, honestly, the the mining that, the extractive mining that that takes place can be environmentally incredibly damaging. 
And then we also had, um, uh, it's interesting uh, in terms of the uh, worst impact, hydrogen uh, fuel was also selected as having uh, uh, you know, pretty adverse impacts as well as uh, nuclear power. Um, the, the other uh, poll that we had taken previously was on uh, how long it would take before we, we were able to get off the grid. And the majority said about 20 years, but was really, what was really interesting was that there was a fairly even distribution, 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, 50, and, and it, will, it will happen just even more slowly. Um, so there seems to be a lack of, of focused confidence that we're going to get there. How do we change? How do we create that acceleration that is required to actually meet those goals that you cited uh, by uh, 2035? to achieve uh, most of our electricity uh, uh, through uh, renewable resources. How do, we, how do we accelerate? Yeah, so I think we have to accelerate in a number of ways. One, we have to provide good information to people, but that's not enough, really. Um, people need to see it in their own community. They need to see that um, school that has a solar array, that is maybe a community solar array so that so that people around the community can participate in in the in the um, in the clean energy economy in that way. They need to see it from from their neighbors. You know, when we when we come down to it, these are um, construction projects, right? And how do people make decisions about to how, when and how to do construction? It's mostly through their their network of trusted advisors and energy is energy is really no different. We have to use trusted advisors advisors to get the message out there, and we have to continue to do um, uh, projects that people can see with their own eyes and they can see the benefits of them across the country, in rural areas, in suburban areas, in inner city areas. So you're talking about four different principles. First, knowledge exchange, right? Education, knowledge exchange. Uh, second, you're talking about practical impacts, cost savings in my wallet. Third, you're talking about jobs, right? I can get a job in this industry over a long and sustainable ter term. I just re read about the boom and bust economy of South Dakota and how all those people who had jobs uh, ended up with flash in a pan experiences, uh, very often with uh, boom economies that extracted their wages just as soon as they earned them, uh, they earned them, and ten years later they're unemployed and and looking for something else. Right. So sustained jobs is really important, and the final piece is inclusivity. Right, making sure that everybody is part of this, this uh, that no one's excluded. Right, so that and that's part of what you're what you've uh, tried to advance with your programs. Exactly, I think that you know, as as a nation, there's so much work we need to do to bring um, to bring together and unify around um, around many issues. And I think clean energy is an issue that you, we really can unify behind because it really does benefit everybody in every in every community and we owe it to the communities that um, suffered from that extractive kind of experience that you that you were talking about and you know um, uh, communities where coal companies have left because coal is no longer economically uh, economically feasible right. need be benefiting from from clean energy and and other advances, and so I think I think that's really critical. And we have um, in Chicago, we had two coal fired uh, plants uh, in the, in the city, and you can imagine the health impacts of uh, having 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 you know smokestacks and and pollution uh, emitted from these these uh, electricity generation plant and the impact it had on the sur surrounding neighborhood. And we have to make sure that those neighborhoods benefit now from, from the clean energy economy. It also seems to be one of those rare situations where every, every part of this country can actually come together. It doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal or progressive or libertarian or 
uh, you know, whatever your stripe is, right? It doesn't matter what, what race or income level, there's a benefit for everyone. Uh, but there are also impediments. We're asking a uh, question in our poll right now. The answer is going to be very interesting in terms of what the biggest uh, barriers are to this transformation. How do you assess those barriers? Because if we, if we can understand what the barriers are, we can sequentially address them. So when you look at the barriers to, to a change, and this is a massive change, right? I mean, our entire global economy has been based on fossil fuels. What do you see as the biggest barriers uh, to a transformation to a completely renewable energy grid and moving into renewables in terms of uh, automobiles, transport, and, and, and you know, uh, aviation is gonna take a, take a while to get to renewables. Um, where do you see the, the barriers as being? Yeah, so from the electric grid point of view, I think the technologies are there. I think there's great people working on, on these issues. I know there will be a challenge with the um, retirement of the, the nuclear fleet, and we'll have to see how, how that barrier is challenged. I think with regard to people's homes and businesses, it's knowledge. Energy is confusing. Um, it's, I mean, again, you know, we want to be able to adjust our thermostat and, and, and get, get, be warm or, and be cool. Um, we don't necessarily want to know how the systems behind them work. And so we need good information. And then the other thing that I think is really um, critical is um, getting that information in, in advance of a situation where your systems are broken. Because when your systems are broken, if, you're, if, you, if it's winter time and you don't have heat. Uh, um, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And so you're going to need that replaced immediately. And it's much more likely to replace like for like, or like for a little bit better, as opposed to really making an ad advancement. And so um, educating the, the contractors and the trades people who are um, who are there to help in that kind of situation is really critical. And so you know, you're, our, you're, bus our business focuses is much on small business development, um, making sure that black, Latinx, people of color run businesses are part of um, are part of the solution so that they can come in and say, hey, your um, heating system is broke. If you you may want to um, install an air source heat pump instead of just sticking sticking with the old the older technology. You know what I find fascinating about what you're saying is that we're talking about consumer education, and it's no different than the consumer education campaigns that were run in the '40s and '50s in the early broadcast media, where people were trying to educate. Uh, us all in black and white um, at, or on the radio um, about the benefits of using the new dishwasher, right? And, and, and the new washing machine and all those products that, that uh, we in the last generations have grown up with, right? So this is consumer education. It's creating an understanding of what options are, right? And then creating solutions. So listening to consumers, uh, treating them with respect, showing them what you know, letting them choose, right? And then uh, helping to, to forge a path. It's a very business-oriented approach that you're using, right? Um, it, 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 is, it is different scale to these times, but it is, it is very much one of not charity, not, not simply doing good, but doing right, right? And, and it, involving all segments of the community. One of the things that we just asked in, in our third poll was, uh, which do you believe are the biggest barriers to adoption of renewable energy? And it was interesting, uh, uh, almost half of the people um, selected active opposition by fossil fuel interests, okay? That's really interesting because there you have two different commercial interests that seem to be uh, vying for the one dollar that's going to be spent, right? You have the renewable interests on the one hand, 
and you have the fossil fuel interests on the other. Do you still see that as, as the future conflict or do you see fossil fuel interests redefining themselves as energy companies and less as drilling companies or oil companies? How do, how do you see this evolving? Yeah, I see both things happening. Uh, I see um, I see bans on I see bans on future new construction on on natural gas e expansion on expanding the current natural natural gas s systems mm -hmm. in many communities, and I also see other communities. Um, banning the ban. <laughs> so making sure that there's a pathway forward for, um, for natural gas um, and, and fossil fuels. And I see companies on both sides. I see companies shifting their investments um, from fossil fuel to renewables. You know, a lot of, a lot of companies actually are currently um, du dual fuel. Like you may get your, um, uh, um, electricity and your gas from the same company that happens in many in many communities in which and we see those companies making the shift away from fossil fuels and and, and, and more into electric we also see companies that are um, our fossil fuel companies today um, doing r d in in renewable technology and making their own investments in, in renewable so I think, during this transition time, you know, some some folks are stay with status quo um, economics, and some are going to be forward thinking. And one I one of the things that I found to be so interesting is some of the shareholder uh, activists, um, and there was just a, co a coverage of this uh, of this situation at Exxon, where uh, shareholder activists are saying, "Look, you're an energy company. You're not just a fossil fuel company. Get with the program, management." Um, and uh, what was interesting to me is that it was a it was a small shareholder who was making the case, but the larger shareholders basically said in a resounding way, yes, exactly, get with the program management. I think that that's that's a very interesting shift because if you are focused on the future and sustainability and future profitability of companies, Getting with the program basically means going to where the consumers are buying. And if the consumers are buying renew renewable, sustainable, you know, uh, solutions where the jobs are, where education is going to have the greatest traction, where you're going to uh, be able to finesse the boom and bust cycles of, of extractive industries by replacing them with, with renewable industries. Um, it's, it really is an amazing declaration. And, and this whole idea of moving into mass markets, which is what you're basically doing is the tip of the spear to make sure that everybody has access is an incredible service to the country and to the world. Thank you. Yeah, and I think really being driven by um, uh, younger generations, <laughs> um, they're, you know, they're saying we're, you know, we are going towards to a clean energy future. And it's just declarative, it's imperative, it's happening. Well, thank you so much, Ann Evans, CEO of Elevate. Thank you so much for sharing the work of your staff, your board, uh, your, your clients, and, and uh, please keep us updated on the work that you're doing in uh, assuring adoption and ensuring the democratization of renewable uh, energy uh, throughout the United States. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.